hard to imagine the modern world without the internal combustion engine. It's used to drive such a vast variety of machines, including, of course, the car. It was the invention of the engine that made the whole idea of the car possible. The principle on which it works is really quite simple. It's really just like a cannon, the explosive fuel forcing out whatever's inside the barrel. This is actually a firework mortar, and uh, it forces out this cylindrical shell, and the explosive fuel is the gunpowder in the bottom. Put it in here. The internal combustion engine is really just the same, except it has a captive piston instead of the shell, and it uses an explosive vapour instead of the gunpowder. Although the idea is very simple, it hasn't been easy to tame the violent energy of all these explosions thousands of times a minute. In this programme, I'm going to look at this wild, unlikely contraption and also at its fuel. Almost all internal combustion engines use a fuel based on crude oil. This naturally seeps out of the ground in places and has been known about since ancient times. It had a variety of uses, but not as a fuel. It's mentioned several times in the Bible, Noah was instructed by God to use it for waterproofing his ark. It was only in the 19th century that oil's potential as a fuel was realised and people started drilling and refining it. One of the products of the refining was a volatile gas oil, or petrol. The petrol was at first regarded as a completely useless by-product. Its vapour was so dangerously inflammable. But it was also realised that it was an enormously potent source of energy. We can show you this with this modified firework mortar. This obviously isn't an experiment to do at home, but if Rex uh, puts a teaspoonful of gunpowder down the mortar and uh, using uh, the lager can as uh, the projectile, Oh dear, well, it is not very powerful. Um, well, now we're going to compare this with, the, uh, with a teaspoonful of petrol and see how far that goes. This time we're igniting it with a spark plug in the side. You can see what an enormous amount of energy there is in the petrol. Although it's hard to believe, this isn't actually an explosion. It's just a very rapid combustion, a very rapid fire. The early internal combustion engines were often called explosion engines, though, and I think it's really a much more appropriate name. The great attraction of the explosion engine is the enormous power it has for its size and weight. This is the smallest engine we could find, complete with fuel tank behind, used for model aeroplanes. Even this has enough power to pull Rex round at quite a speed, though it takes a bit of time to gather momentum. The power of any modern car engine is quite awesome. Even a basic one is rated at about 60 horsepower. That's literally equivalent to the power of 60 horses. The first successful explosion engine was built by an inventor called Etienne Lenoir in 1859. He simply threw away the boiler of a steam engine and modified it so that it would ignite the piped gas supplied for lighting. Unfortunately, the violence of the explosions tended to damage the piston and valves, and it was much less efficient than the original steam engine. However, his engine inspired other inventors, including a German wholesale grocery salesman called Nicholas Otto. 
is lost. Herr Otto. Enchanté. Otto came up with an engine that was much more efficient. His engines were immediately successful, and he sold over 35,000 to power factories and workshops. One of the first Otto engines to be built in Britain was the 1895 Hornsby Ackroyd. It all still looks very like a steam engine, but it runs on paraffin, another product of refining crude oil. It first has to be heated to make it an inflammable vapour. It's a two-man job to start it, and it never goes round faster than 100 times a minute. What's going on inside is that first the vapour is sucked into the cylinder. Then it's compressed, ignited, and finally the exhaust gases are pushed out. This sequence, suck, squash, bang, blow, is called the four-stroke cycle. Otto's big improvement was squashing the vapour up before igniting it, which gave the engine much more power. Although from the outside a modern car engine looks completely different and it's obviously got more than one cylinder, inside it's really quite similar. If you can start turning it over. The piston goes in and out. The crankshaft goes round and round. And this is the exhaust valve with the strong spring keeping it closed and the cam pushing it open. The other valve, the inlet valve, is tucked away behind on this engine. The rusty space around the edge is full of water, essential for cooling the heat of the explosions. All these fundamental features have remained unchanged. Otto's engines were much too large and clumsy for a car, but one of his employees, called Gottlieb Daimler, developed a much smaller engine in 1883. This ran much faster and used the volatile petrol as the fuel. It produced nearly as much power as Otto's, but weighed ten times less. Daimler's high-speed engine finally made the idea of a car practical, and it was quickly realised that cars could do some quite remarkable things. The early engines did still have their drawbacks, though. This is a 1902 Wolsey owned by Jack Howes. Under the bonnet, the bonnet really just contains the enormous cooling system and radiator. The engine's tucked away right underneath. It's not entirely easy to operate. There are 20 operations you have to do before you can start it. Where do you start? First thing I do is to connect the battery, then I turn on the petrol tap and just give the carburetor a, a touch to draw the petrol through. My next operation after that is to turn on the 12 oilers for the total loss oiling system. Now, the most important job of all, having inserted the starting handle, as you can obviously see, in the side of the engine, is to put it on half compression. Otherwise, there's a great risk of breaking your wrist. Turn on the switch, adjust the throttle and ignition controls, just tricky to get it going. There are two levers controlling the fuel and ignition that have to be skillfully adjusted as you drive along. One false move and the thing stalls. Also, the engine's very inefficient by today's standards, only doing about 12 miles to the gallon. 
and the total loss oiling system leaves a trail of oil along the ground wherever it goes. Engines haven't changed radically since this time, but their design has been continuously refined. Arguably the biggest single improvement has been in the oil and how the engine puts it to use. An engine wouldn't last for long without oil. The oil's fed through holes in the castings to all the bearings. There's actually an enormous amount of oil being pumped round all the time. I can show you this if I knock a hole in the oil filter. This may be a bit messy. The oil doesn't just move a tape. It all gets rather black and filthy like this, because it's also a detergent. It cleans up the deposits left by the exploding gases. Before this detergent was added in the 1940s, you had to strip down the engine and clean everything out, or decoke it, every few thousand miles. Now you just have to change the oil and the filter. I've got to turn it off, actually. Whoops. Ha, ha, ha.